But this morning we are, uh, I mean, this is our Christmas Sunday. This is the Sunday, uh, last Sunday before Christmas, and, I, and I, I'm really looking forward to tonight, like I said before. Uh, I, I just, I enjoy uh, night communions. It, it just seems like a really, it's more of an intimate time with the Lord. But then on Sunday mornings for the month of, of December so far, we have been doing uh, sermons on Christmas carols. That's been our series is on Christmas carols and Christmas songs. And I, I love our Christmas songs. And of course, we started out with Joy to the World. And how, how Jesus, when he came to this world, he brought joy. And, but that joy wasn't just for Christmas time. And how, how Joy to the World is really not even a Christmas song when you look at all the words of it. It's just about joy altogether. We, we spoke about Emmanuel, the fact that God came to this earth, God with us. Um, and then last week we talked about go tell it on the mountain. And how that is our, our job as Christians. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, your job is to spread that word. Your job, you're, you're responsible for telling the world about it. Um, but today, we're going to talk about what child is this. Uh, and, and it goes along with our sermon on Emmanuel. It goes along with that script. But as we look at it and we start to talk about what child is this? Who is this baby in a manger? For, for so many people, we see, uh, well, for so many people in this world, Christmas has a secular meaning. For so many people in this world, our uh, Christmas is about Santa Claus and about uh, about shopping, about gifts, about, I mean, even Hallmark movies. They are, they are all about finding love for Christmas. <laughs> I saw a thing the other day that said, said uh, what has uh, 15 actors, four plots, two writers, and it said 460 Hallmark movies. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, that's not what Christmas is about. And even so many people in this world, and you see all over the place, Jesus is the reason for the season. That, that becomes a tagline. And, and we, we talk about that, but for so many people who even understand that Jesus is the reason for the season, they don't really, un they, they're in their mind, in their, in their vision, it's this baby. We talk, it's the nativity scene. And, and I love the nativity scene, and it's a beautiful scene, and it's a beautiful uh, way to look at things. But the fact is, is that we look at Jesus as a baby. And, they, and we know that he's the son of God. We, we, we see that. But as we look at this song, What Child Is This? I want to I go over the, the words of it. It says, What child is this who is laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Whom angels greet and anth with anthems sweet, while shepherds watch their keeping. So bring him, or well, I missed a verse there. But uh, the last one is the one I really like. So bring him incense, gold and myrrh. Come peasant king to own him. The king of kings salvation brings. Let loving hearts enthrone him. Now the second verse, like I said, I forgot to put it in here. But the second verse is why lies he in such mean estate where ox and ass are feeding. Good Christians fear for sinners here the silent word is pleading. And then of course the, the, the course is this, this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him laud the babe, the son of Mary. And as we look at these, these questions, and we look at these, these are questions that people are still asking today. This is, this is a question that Jesus himself posed to his disciples. This is a question that so many people have trouble answering. Is what child is this? Who is this in a manger? And even though they may know that he's Jesus, they may know that he is, they, they may call him the Son of God, they don't truly understand 
who he is. Listen, he came to this earth. He looked like any other baby. You know, we, we see these manger scenes, and I've seen them, and you've seen them, they, and they, they have, you know, of course they have the wise men, the angels, and everybody gathered around the, the, the stable, and, they, and they, they've got this halo around Jesus. Jesus looked in that manger like any other baby in a manger. His, his conception was miraculous. His birth was normal. His birth was like any other birth. Uh, it, it, we, we read about Jesus being born in a, in a manger, and to us that is shocking, or being born and placed in a manger... The fact is, is most people didn't have cribs back in those days. They didn't have rocking cribs. They didn't have Graco to make things like that for them. And you placed a baby wherever you, was the easiest and wherever you had. And, and, and a manger was probably not that uncommon to place a baby in. I don't know. But the thing is, he looked like any other child. And... and the shepherds are the only ones that we have record of that morning or that night who knew who he was. Now, I, I truly believe, like I said, I, like I said last week, I, I believe, I'm not told, but I believe that there was probably other people who were told in a miraculous way. The, angel, the shepherds are the ones that we have record of. But people were still asking who is this child? Let's go to Luke chapter 1. And we'll answer that question. Who is this child? Luke chapter 1. And we will, we will start with verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning. As we read your scripture, and as we read the account of how your son came to this earth, Lord, we know that it was such a miraculous way, and we know, Lord, that you brought us the most precious gift, uh, that could ever be brought. And Lord, we just thank you for coming to this earth to die on the cross to, to save us from our sin. In your name we pray. Amen. What a proclamation. Can you imagine the feeling? Can you imagine the emotion? Can you imagine what Mary must have felt like and what she must have thought? Number one, waking up and seeing an angel standing before you. That had to be one of the most awesome sights in this world. Uh, we, we see every time that we see an angel in the Bible, 
the first words out of their mouth is fear not. Because it is such an awesome picture. It is such an awesome sight that I can imagine uh, what it must have felt like. We know that they were, well, they were always a beautiful man. They were, always, uh, they were always glowing when they came in their form of an angel, in their glory as an angel. And this angel came before Mary, Gabriel nonetheless, who was the, the messenger of God. And he came to Mary and said, you are favored. That right there in itself is saying something. Imagine God just coming to you and saying, I favor you. I find pleasure in you. That's something we should all have a desire to have God tell us. That He finds pleasure in us. That we, that we have impressed Him. I dare say that, that many of the things in my life I try to live the best I can and I try to live for God and I try to, to show Him everywhere I go. But, but I ask myself, do, does God find pleasure in me? Am I favored by God? And to have Him come to you in, as an angel, have, to send an angel to you and say, I find pleasure with you. You are most favored. It's such an awesome thing. But then to be told, I'm going to bring myself into this world. I'm going to come to this world and I'm going to show up and I'm going to live in this world as a human being and I'm going to live for and, and, I'm, and I'm going to come and, and I'm going to live out a perfect life and I'm going to be sacrificed and I'm going to die on a cross and you are going to be a part of it. You are going to be the means that I take to come into this world. We sing the song, everybody in the choir said, well, what we should sing, Mary, did you know? That's a hard song to sing for one thing. But she did know. I mean, that's a question. In the song it asked, Mary, did you know that your son is going to be all of this? We see here that we are told he is going to be called the son of the highest. Now as we addressed in, in, when we talked about uh, the song Emmanuel, he was the highest. He was God. Only come in the form of the man. But he was going to be known while he was on this earth as the son of God, the son of the highest. And Mary knew that. She was told that. We see right here that she was told by Gabriel, your son will be called the son of the highest. He will, be, he will ascend to the throne of David. He will be of the throne of David forever. He will be of the, house of the, the king of the house of Jacob forever. So yes, Mary knew. And yes, Mary was a good Jewish girl. God didn't pick some person that just was average. He didn't pick somebody that went out and lived the way that she wanted to live. He picked a, a Jewish girl who was godly. He picked a Jewish girl who had probably been raised to understand the prophets and had been taught the prophets and understood. So when, when, when Gabriel brought this to her, she asked, how can this be? And when he told her that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her, she understood. She knew the power of God. She understood the power of God. She, did, she may not have understood how exactly it was going to happen, but she understood that God had the power to make it happen. She didn't continue to question. She said what we should all say. I'm your servant. God, I am your servant. Takes me back to, to Isaiah when, when Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. Mary said the same thing. Here am I. Use me. We should all have that type of mentality. We should all have that kind of, of um, ideas when it comes to serving God. We should be willing to say, God, whatever you want me to do, I will do. So when we ask this question, what child is this? He was going to be known as the Son of God. But I want you to understand something. 
He wasn't just a baby. He stepped out of heaven to come to this earth. He stepped down from the place he was at. But he never stepped down from the position. That baby who was laying in the manger was the king of kings. He was still the Lord of lords. He was still the creator of all that was created. He was still God. So when we ask what child is this, we got to quit looking at him as just a baby in a manger. We talk about, listen, I've heard it all my life. Jesus didn't start his ministry until he was 30 years old. Jesus ministered his whole life. We saw him at 12 years old teaching in the temple. Jesus was always God. He didn't wait till he was 30 years old to become God on this earth. He didn't wait till he was 30 years old to start living as God. He, was, he had all knowledge. He had all knowledge while he was laying in that manger. He knew what was going on around him. Because he was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords laying in the manger. He knew that he came for a special purpose. Listen, I dare say, I've heard all my life that, that the wedding at Cana, turning the water into wine, was Jesus' first miracle. It's the first recorded miracle. Jesus was God from the time he came, from the beginning of time till the time he came till today. He never stepped down from the position of God. He never relinquished his power as God. He only stepped out of heaven to live as one of us. He left that place to become a man. Now, Matthew chapter 16 is where Jesus address this same question. We ask today, we, this song asks, what child is this? But Jesus asked the question to his disciples. Matthew 16 verse 13 says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? I, I the Son of Man, am. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Notice Peter didn't say, I believe you're the Christ. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. People are still asking today, who is this Jesus? Who is this man? Who was this baby? We see in, the, in this scripture, the people of Jesus' day, they still had great respect for him. I know that, I know that the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had it out for him and they wanted to kill him. But when, when he asked the disciples, he said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. 
Listen, for them to think that Jesus was one of those men was saying something. These were, these were some of the greatest men to be known at that time. John the Baptist, even the Pharisees came out to listen to John the Baptist. They were afraid to speak out against him. They knew that he had power. They knew that he was from God. They knew that he, he spoke the word of God. They had great respect and fear of John the Baptist. Elijah was known as one of the greatest prophets to ever live. The people, the people still, they talked about Elijah. They feared Elijah. Kings were afraid of Elijah. They knew who Elijah was. So for them to say that Jesus was, was John the Baptist or that he was Elijah, that was saying something for those people. That showed that they had great fear and respect for him. Most of them did. They, 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 they knew that he was something great. They knew that he was something awesome. Jeremiah, man, he, he was well respected as, as well. The prophets all were. They had all done great things of God. And, and they, that for that reason, most of the people of the day, now I know that, like I said, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they wanted to get rid of him. And a lot of people wanted to kill him and stone him and all this stuff. But listen, a lot of the people, they knew that he was something great. Did you know that almost every major religion in this world address Jesus Christ. They do. They address Jesus Christ. And they think along the same lines, they think he was a great teacher. They talk about him as a great man. They talk about him as this wonderful teacher. Some of them talk about him as a demigod. He was a creation of God. They think that he was, he, he was this he he done great things. They think he was a great prophet. Listen, that don't cut it. He was all those things. He was a great teacher. He was a great man. He was a he was a healer. But he wasn't a demigod. He wasn't a creation of God. He was God. Listen, he came to this earth. You know the Muslims, the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, all even even you get into Confucian and, and they address Jesus Christ and they respect him. They fear him. They will not speak out against him. Even the ones that claim that they serve the same God that we do. You know the Muslims say that Allah and our God is the same God. If you don't include Jesus Christ as God, you don't serve the same God. And they don't. Listen, Jesus, he came to this earth and listen, he lived as a man. But as you go into, if you read into Matthew chapter 2, Herod couldn't kill him. Satan couldn't seduce him. Death couldn't stop him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Amen. I mean, you think about it. this is who we're talking about. This is this this baby, this child that was in the manger, the one that the one that the angels came and told the shepherds about. That is this child. Somebody that was so much greater than all of that. You see, then Jesus stopped and he said. Those are all great things. Those are all great ways to be known. That shows that the people have great respect for me. That shows that, that shows that the people do fear me. And they know that I'm a part of God. But who do you say that I am? Peter didn't miss a beat. You know, we give Peter a hard time. Peter had his faults. Everybody likes to point out about Peter denying Christ. But he may have. But Peter was also the first one to proclaim Christ. He was the first one that we see in the scripture that said, You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. Peter addressed it. Peter proclaimed him as the Son of God. Peter proclaimed him as the Christ. And when he did, Jesus said, You have spoken well. Flesh and blood didn't tell that to you. You know what that means? My job is menial. God 
told Peter who Jesus was. And if you, if you get your information and you only from me, you're not getting a lot. You see, the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter. The Holy Spirit, God the Father through the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter and told him who Jesus was. The same Holy Spirit that came down on the day of Pentecost and gave Peter the words to say and the sermon to preach is the ones who told Peter, is the one who told Peter, this is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Folks, we have to hear it the same way. We have to get it from the Holy Spirit. You know that, do you know that you cannot make a decision to follow Christ on your own? People, people think that they, I'll just make that decision you know, when it's convenient for me. I'll make that decision when I want to. Listen, you've got to be drawn by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to speak to you. The Holy Spirit has to convict you. The Holy Spirit has to draw you in order for you to come to Christ. But when He does, when He draws you, when He pulls you, and when He says, it's time, we've got to be like Peter. We've got to say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we have to put Him in charge of our life. You see, Jesus told Peter, because you have proclaimed this, upon you I will build my church. Do you know that when you proclaim that, He tells you the same thing. You may not be the first pastor of the church, like Peter was. You may not be the first, and according to the Catholics, he was their first pope. Okay? He was, he was, the church was founded and started with Peter. He preached the first sermon in the first church. I'm not going to get that kind of recognition. But he's still building the church on me. And if you have accepted him and you have proclaimed him as Christ, the Son of the living God, and you have made him Lord of your life, he's still building the church on you. We're all part of the foundation of this church. Peter wasn't just the only one that he built the church upon. He builds the church upon everybody who proclaims him as the Son of God. It becomes our responsibility. Once we, once we know Him and once we accept Him into our life, then it becomes our responsibility to be a part of building His church from that point on. And it just continues to grow and continues to grow and continues to, to feed and to bless Him and continue to uplift Him. And if we fail at that, we have failed Him. It's like our message last week, go tell it on the mountain. We have that responsibility to go and to tell and to spread His Word. And when we do that, we are continuing to build His church. And that's what He expects from us. I love the, 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 the last verse of the song. It says, so bring Him incense, gold, and myrrh. These were, these were uh, presents worthy of a king we're supposed to bring him something too now I saw I saw a little cartoon that said after the wise men left the wiser women came and they brought fresh diapers casseroles for a week and some formula you see we're supposed to continue to bring him something we bring him our heart we bring him ourselves See, the wise men brought him gifts that was honor, to honor a king. And yeah, they used these gifts because, because God sent Joseph to take his family on the run. And they used these gifts. But we are to continue to bring him something. Once we acknowledge you are Christ, the Son of the living God, then we bring him ourselves. That's our gift to him. That's our gift is to give Him us. You see, He's willing to come into our heart and He's willing to come in and be a part of our life. And as, a, as the song says, the King of Kings salvation brings. He brings us that salvation, but in turn He expects us to give back to Him all that we are. 
That doesn't just mean we say, yes, Lord, I want, I want your salvation. That means that we say, yes, Lord, I want your salvation, but I want to serve you. I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want to be a part of all that you are. I want to be used by you. Listen, he don't, he don't just want to save us. He wants to be a part of us. He wants us to be a part of him. That's who this child is. You see, he asked the question to Peter, who do you say that I am? John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he goes on to say, And he was in the beginning with God. All things that were made were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. You see, he was God. But when he asked Peter, Who do you say I am? I remember as I was going through a, a, a study called Share Jesus Without Fear. One of the questions is, is who to, to you, who is Jesus? So many people answer the question, he was the son of Joseph, he was son of God. He said, if, he, if it's anything other than he's my Savior, you might want to dig a little deeper in your questions. You see, he is the son of God. He is God Himself. He is the, the Alpha and the Omega. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but is He Lord of your life? You see, that's the question when we say, what child is this? Is, who is He to you? See, to me, He's more than the King of kings. He's more than the Creator of the universe. That's hard to say. How do you, how do you think about that? He's more than the creator of the universe. He's my personal savior. Now that's something. The fact that the creator of the universe took time, had a desire to know me, had a desire to draw me, and to die for me so that he could be my savior. I owe him. I owe him my everything. This child, this child that we sing about, this child that we talk about, this child that we celebrate at Christmas is more than a child. And because of that, I owe him more than, more than all the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that, that, that the world can have. I owe him my everything. I owe him my life. I owe him my heart. I owe him my service. This morning... Who is he to you? If he's your savior, is he your all? Have you given all to him? Have you brought him gifts of everything? Have you given him your life? Not just called on him as your savior. Are you serving him? Are you working for him? Are you giving your all to him? Because that's what he deserves. But if you're here this morning, and you've never given your life to Him. And you've never accepted Him as your Savior. You may, you may acknowledge that He's the King of kings. You may acknowledge that He's the Lord of lords. But is He Lord of your life? This morning as we stand and turn to Him number 434.